I suggest that we can prove the existence of God from the impossibility of the contrary. The transcendental proof for God's existence is that without him, it is impossible to prove anything. The atheist worldview is irrational and cannot consistently provide the preconditions of intelligible experience, science, logic, or morality. The atheist worldview cannot allow for laws of logic, the uniformity of nature, the ability for the mind to understand the world, and moral absolutes. And in that sense, the atheist world view cannot account for our debate tonight. Dr. Greg Bonson, and you're doctor from USC in epistemology, and as a Christian theologian, of course, you have done many debates and written in the area of God's existence. Uh, where does one begin in presenting evidence for God? How would you uh, approach George Smith, for example? Well, I appreciate about George, I've only met him this afternoon, um, but I appreciate about his writings that he understands how important epistemology is to the whole discussion. If we're going to talk about the existence of God, we're not going to want it uh, to reduce the question of emotion or just volitional commitment of some sort without uh, man's intellect being engaged. And I think he's right about that. As Christians, we do not give up our intellect when we believe in God or follow the scriptures. And so, um, since the issue is epistemology, this may not be what many of your hearers would like to get into, perhaps, but we need to talk about what amounts to proof and what amounts to knowledge and how these things are possible. Mm -hmm. And I would say that uh, we have to be extremely critical. Uh, I know that Christians often have the reputation for not being critically minded, and I, I think that's probably a, a failing on our part when we're like that. But if we're going to be critically minded, we need to examine the presuppositions of, of our thinking. And um, we have to look at the worldview that we're espousing when we argue in a particular way or not. And so if, if I were, you know, talking with George over coffee, I think I would probably talk to him, first of all, about what outlook he has on the world. What does he conceive reality to be? How does he know what he knows? How should he live his life? And I would compare that to the Christian worldview, what we understand to be reality and how we know what we know and how we should live our lives. And then, of course, we're going to have to eventually get to the point of deciding how does one choose one worldview over another. Uh, at some point, maybe after two or three cups of coffee, I would eventually challenge George that um, on an atheist worldview, the presuppositions of atheism do not provide a foundation for proving anything whatsoever. And therefore, in one sense, the strongest evidence and argument for the existence of God is that without a belief in God, you can't prove anything. And so I would make that the foundation for reason. Um, often, and uh, I think you'll see this if you read uh, George's book, you have people who present something of a Thomistic approach to faith and reason where faith um, fills in the gaps where reason uh, lets us down or is inadequate. Uh, my own theological perspective is more Augustinian rather than uh, Thomistic, and I would argue instead that uh, everything we do uh, engages the reason as a tool of man's intellect, but that the cogent use of reason is impossible apart from a foundation of faith. And you see, I would preach that to my Christian brothers and sisters. They need to you know, read the scriptures and use their minds and not simply have an emotional Christianity. But that would also be the premise that I would approach an atheist or an unbeliever with. I'd say that the best use of reason, in fact the only use of reason, comes about when Christian faith is the foundation for it, or the worldview in terms of which you use your reason. But Greg, you wouldn't defer to faith as being some mystical faculty or credulity. You're talking about uh, a, a belief based upon evidence then. Yes. Um, there have been plenty of Christians throughout history that have taken that mystical approach to faith. They've defined it as a, a second approach uh, to knowledge apart from man's reason and so forth. But I think those are misguided. Mm -hmm. I would say that faith is essentially a belief and the reason we talk about faith and reason is because when we have faith, it means we are trusting somebody else's expertise in some area. In that sense, the student at the university who first hears lectures about U.S. history or about logic or what have you begins to learn about these fields because he or she has faith in the instructor that they're giving them, you know, the straight scoop and that sort of thing. Christians have faith in another person. I mean, not 
apart from that, but in addition we have faith in the person of God himself revealed in the scriptures. But I wouldn't say that that faith is apart from reason. I would say that engages the faculty of reason, and it is in fact the foundation for the use of reason. So would proper reasoning lead you to believe in the existence of God? I would argue that there isn't any proper reasoning apart from the foundation of belief in God. Mm -hmm. That apart from, it's not, so matter, it's not so much that it leads to belief in God, as belief in God is the necessary precondition for using man's reason at all. So if evolution did occur on this planet, it was literally a miracle and therefore evidence for the existence of God. <laughs> so I don't think this is an argument for atheism, quite the contrary. It really provides good grounds for thinking that God superintended the process.